I take right. back the projection and I just get to see them actually for who they are, what their behavior has shown me time and time and time and time again, it kind of lowers the bar on what I can expect from them. And suddenly it doesn't feel quite as bad when they are exactly who they've always been. Welcome to the Holistic Life Navigation Podcast, where we explore life through the lens of somatics. I'm Luis Mojica, a somatic educator who teaches people how to find safety in themselves. Your turn to learn begins now. So I'm really happy to welcome Dr. Ingrid Clayton to the podcast. Thank you for being here. I am so elated. Thank you for having me. <laughs> you bring me so much joy. Let me start there. <laughs> Let's just begin there because th I came across you on Instagram. I don't know how. Yeah. You know how Instagram works. I, yes. <laughs> just yes. Like, just feeds you these way. people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it fed me your your work. And I was, I think it was very um, profound for me, the timing, because I had just had this kind of revelation, which to you or other people listening might might be obvious, how important joy and humility are to balance out the heaviness of trauma work. Mm -hmm. You know, for so many years, I was just really focusing on the vortex of trauma and people's pains. And and then something shifted and I noticed, oh, wow, joy is like a medicine and a, a, a major resource. Mm -hmm. And then I found your page and I was just so elated to find someone who had come from such hell and was still able to laugh at the human experience. Like I just love you so much for that. You this don't have no idea. This is a complete <laughs> mutual adoration society. I feel so gifted by your presence, even on the internet. And before I logged on today, because this is our first conversation, but I feel like I know you. I feel like we are kindred spirits. I mm -hmm. I love the work that you do, and you have taught me so much in this last, you know, I've been on Instagram maybe a year and a half now, and I feel like maybe we found each other pretty early in my journey. So I've been learning from you and loving your work. And yes, thank you for appreciating the, um, the creativity and even the hilarity that, that has ended up happening <laughs> sort of not, not even that intentionally, uh, for me, but I have also found the importance of bringing a lightness to this very heavy work. And because it can still feel so heavy to me, even in my own body, um, I think I've said before, like sometimes I can't read the heavy textbooks. I can't read, like that stuff feels so triggering to me. My whole being sort of repels it like, no. Mm -hmm. But when I hear a funny audio and I can marry it with a heavy topic, it gives me access to the material that not only am I like digesting it intellectually, but the shame, just like if I can laugh at it, the shame goes away. And mm. that was sort of my benchmark for a long time. It was like, if this makes me laugh or if I want to watch it two or three times, I have to post it. Like, I don't mm. care what <laughs> anyone else, you know, thinks of it or gets out of it. It was healing and helpful to me. And so I appreciate that it's been healing and helpful to other people. Oh. You have no idea. Even when you said, if I can laugh at it, it makes the shame go away. Like I, I just have to pause that statement just so yeah. we can feel that those listening. Cause it, yeah. oh, mm. someone was just asking me the other day about fits of laughter mm. and, and how that relates to the somatic work. And when mm. I've sat with clients, I've seen them go from the heavy, deep sorrow and pain and then as it transmutes, this eruption of laughter comes out, yes. right? Almost this like yes. maniac of survival. <laughs> I think it's so brilliant. And, and that's how I see you. You use that vessel, that, um, that medium of that transmutation, which is the laughter to get across really heavy messages, which again is so meaningful to me. Uh, I have one, uh, all my posts, I have one post that's funny and you inspired. <laughs> Yay! My work is done here. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I have more in the making, but it's just so, uh, it's so new. But uh, so yeah, anyway, okay. I'm going to stop. Gonna but stop. you're so playful. I feel like your, your lightness comes through this, um, well, like you said, the humility side, right? That that there's this playfulness and there's this willingness to kind of show yourself in this mm. fluid, flexible, very open-hearted way um, that feels like it's on the same branch of that uh, laughter, joy, you know, creativity mm. uh, tree. 
I really appreciate that you can see that because it, it feels playful for me. Yes, I experienced yeah. it that way. So, oh, yeah. great. That's awesome. <laughs> I, I don't know where to begin with you. There's so many things I want to say. So I I, I have some things written down. Yeah. You're, I have yet to read your book. It's on my list. It's on my stack, I should say, of books to read. Because I kind of wanted to start with just mm. getting to know you without knowing your book. You know, I kind of, I love to just meet someone for the first time in a lot of ways. Yes. Uh, and then I'm probably going to dive into it. So I guess I just want to first say, tell us what the book is called and what the story behind the book is. Okay. And I appreciate you wanting to get to know me as a person. Um, I like that approach. So um, I've written two books. One I wrote a long time ago, over 10 years ago. It was based on my dissertation research on spiritual bypass. And that one's called Recovering Spirituality. But my most recent work, it came out just a couple months ago, is a memoir and it's called Believing Me, and the subtitle is Healing from Narcissistic Abuse and Complex Trauma. And so, um, as you know, I am a clinical psychologist, I'm a trauma therapist, and um, I had no intentions whatsoever of writing a memoir, certainly of writing a memoir on childhood trauma, of putting my face on this topic of childhood trauma or narcissistic abuse. And so I did, I really never thought I would write another book again. And um, long story short is that my stepfather, who is the narcissist in my life, he passed away just over five years ago. And when he died, uh, I felt safer and freer on this earth than maybe I had ever felt. It was this visceral, undeniable, like I take a deep breath even as I think about that experience, which happened right here <laughs> where mm. I found out I literally laid down on the floor right here and I put my hand on my heart and I just, that was all I could acknowledge that like something is happening where I feel freer and safer than maybe I've ever felt. And it wasn't like I had a close relationship with him, but he was married to my mom until the day he died. So he was always in that orbit. Yeah. And in that way, I was always linked in, always in those handcuffs, what I sort of refer to as this internal straitjacket of my life. And it started to loosen that day. And after it loosened a little bit more, a few other things happened. And I was um, literally just struck, Luis, in the middle of the night with these pages of writing. I didn't know what it was at all, but it was complete stories, these essays, from my life, from childhood, but also adulthood. I couldn't understand how they hung together, what it was all for, but I couldn't stop. And so in between, you know, having a two-year-old at that time and seeing clients during the day, I would start like, grabbing my phone just to dictate. It was all happening so fast and furious. Um, and it felt important. It felt like a calling. And it wasn't for several years <laughs> of this process until I looked down at these words that I'd written, and I could see for the first time two things that I didn't know. I didn't know or understand that what I grew up with was narcissism and what that meant, primarily because gaslighting is effective. <laughs> and I was gaslit. I grew up in gaslighting, in deep emotional manipulation that told me that I was the problem, I was the liar, I was wrong. And I didn't consciously completely believe it, but my body learned how to exist in that sort of manipulation. So part of me was like, well, did it really happen? And was it that bad? And was it that big of a deal? And I didn't have bruises and all that sort of minimization, which is also just common, we know, with emotional abuse or neglect and childhood trauma. So I could finally see my own story through the lens of a trauma therapist hmm. and see that I grew up in narcissism and that I have complex PTSD, also something I did not know. And this is after a lifetime of sitting on many therapist couches and being in 12-step programs. And I mean, I had been hungry to grow and change and fix this thing inside me that I thought was broken my whole life. I just really did think I was broken. And if nothing, I'm so emotional about it today. And if none of these things were fixing that fundamental thing, I must really be broken. And so when when I could start to unlock it, I saw, oh my word, these stories are what happened, the traumatic events, part one, 
the trauma responses, the unmetabolized, unhealed, unprocessed trauma responses, and all of the ways that I, that I lived with that for so long. And then I could really look at, okay, so what is the healing? And even though I am a therapist, it came as a memoir. I felt the importance of it being a memoir in part because if I have all this clinical information and I couldn't see it, it's like that language didn't serve me. Mm -hmm. But the language of story mm -hmm. has the power to convey. And that's the thing that I've been so surprised about in people reading the book is, is how many people are saying, Ingrid, you wrote my story. It's like I'm reading my story. And again, the minimizer in me and the one who said it wasn't that bad and maybe this was kind of unique. Yes, maybe some of the particulars are unique to me, but the essence of that experience I'm finding is way more universal in a way that totally breaks my heart because, ugh. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but Wait, I'm let's so pause there a minute. Yeah, yeah. Because this is so profound to me. The first part that's profound to me is how... It, it, <laughs> There's many parts. You're speaking about how the trauma, the event takes place, part one. Like you said, these, yeah. these horrible events that were very chronic for you. Yes. And then there's the response to the event, which is the trauma response. For decades. <clears throat> for decades. Yeah. Yeah. And those those responses really, they become our, our personalities and our behaviors, our identities, our lifestyles, right? Our relationship pattern, styles. My, yeah, yes, everything. Yes. Uh -huh. What I find so profound about this is when he died and you got the news and you laid down, you held your chest, mm -hmm. you felt the safety for the first time in you, this depth of it, I should say, as you're saying. Yeah. Yes. And I'm imagining that gave you the capacity or the space for some of this to start emerging. 100%. And because as you know, healing isn't linear. It's not like none of the stuff I had done had been helpful up till that point, right? So I was already actually in what is now the healthiest, most miraculous relationship of my life. I've been with my now husband for almost 10 years. And so I had the safety of my relationship with him. And then my stepfather passed and I did have decades of sobriety. And so there were some building blocks in place, certainly that led up to this. Um, but that was a profound one. I mean, there are times where I go, man, why couldn't I have sort of known this and seen it sooner? Which is also why I'm so passionate about sharing it because I don't want other people to have to live the way I did for decades. But then I also go, you know what? It was not safe for me to do this deep dive while he was still on this earth. And, you know, trauma responses are there for a reason to keep us safe. We will always prioritize safety and survival. And that is what my body was doing. And when it felt safe enough to go, you know what, I'm taking my story back. I'm taking my voice back. Um, it was like a switch was flipped and phew, I've been going nonstop ever since. I think what's so important for people to hear and, and probably why your book is having such an impact is like you said, a, a clinical psychologist wasn't able to connect to her own trauma. That's right. Um, Again, not because you lack anything, but because the body is designed to very beautifully package mm -hmm. it up yeah. until there's that capacity to even receive the package, right? And I, I think yes. that's what I, I really want to kind of sit with for a moment mm -hmm. um, because there's, you said it yourself, you said it's, it's abstract, it's not linear. Yes. So we can have these concepts and words in, in the DSM and even ways of being with expressions that come from trauma. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, until the trauma is felt by the traumatized system itself, and there's a relationship that we create with the trauma inside, until that happens, it doesn't quite metabolize. It's managed, but the metabolizing of it doesn't quite happen until that relationship with it occurs. Can yeah. you tell us about that for you? Was that well, what I'm, what I'm experiencing, actually, as you're talking about it, I love it when this happens. It's like a deeper layer of understanding and a deeper layer of even my own shame, right? Because there's a part of me that loves telling people, yes, I have these three letters after my name and I've specialized and I've sat in trainings with Peter Levine and Dr. Bessel van der Kolk and all of these people didn't know, didn't know, didn't know. And I love that that releases people from their own shame of going, well, if she didn't know, then maybe it's okay that I haven't been able to connect the dots of these things. And yet there's still that part of me that goes, Ingrid, you're such an idiot. Why couldn't you figure it out? Which 
you know, I have two primary uh, trauma responses that I've lived in. One is fawning and one is flight. Flight is the perfectionist, the one who went and got those three letters after her name because she tried so desperately to figure it out. And that part of me goes, oh, Ingrid, don't tell him that you couldn't figure it out, you know. But when you're talking about the, the beautiful wisdom of the body and how we do have this very protected sort of relationship to our trauma, to our body, to these things in a way that until it is safe, there's nothing. I could have run 8 million circles around it. I did. I did. I ran 8 million circles around it. And um, I'm I'm getting on a deeper level as I'm hearing you talk that um, just the, the truth of that. And it allows me to rest a little bit deeper in my own nature and go, you're just right, Ingrid. You're just mm. You're just right. Um, I have to. I have to also reflect. You just said something. Um, it had to feel safe, and I just, I just have to say that again because the sentence itself, the statement, "It had to feel safe," right there, speaks to you know, what I what I talk about, which is the sovereign body. You know, mm. it is a sovereign animal that has its own instincts, and it knows how to digest food, and it knows how to make n- nutrients, and it knows how to package trauma. And we are this, you know, strange consciousness. We don't even know who we are fully. That witnesses this body. So when you say it has to feel safe, I feel the shame come off of me. Any shame is left because we take responsibility for mm. this automatic ancient thing the body knows how to do, and it's like it actually has nothing to do with us. <laughs> it's yes, like, I think that that's why even looking at myself. And it's slightly different language, but we're talking about the same thing through the lens of trauma allowed me to make sense of myself because I really did believe I was going to figure it out. I really believed, okay, I get this is a dysfunctional family, right? My eighth grade uh, research paper when we could have written about anything and my friends are writing about snowboarding and their favorite movie. The title of my paper was Alcoholism, the Family Disease. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I was 12 years old. And I have been trying to solve this puzzle, believe, deeply believing that I could. Mm-hmm. So really getting that there's my conscious mind and then there are our instincts and this subconscious experience and the physiology of the body. And I'm not scientific enough to understand all of it, but I just <laughs> need to know enough to know that this prefrontal cortex thing, the last thing to develop in our brain is not the answer. <laughs> not, not a really great way to say it. <laughs> it's so not the answer. It's, I, I love this too, because even as I hear you say, I thought I could solve it. Yes. I, I, I hear, I just hear these words in my mind that says, there's nothing to solve. It, it's again, it's it's something just to experience and receive when you have the capacity to. It's like mm-hmm. a reverberation, you know, the explosion happens, the echo hasn't quite reached us yet because we can't handle it. And then when we can, it finally reaches us and then we get to either open our arms to it or suffocate it with something else, you know, based on our circumstance. Yeah. And th- that's why, again, that's why you in particular, and your videos are a big part of this for me, you, um, you take the, how do I say this? Do I say bureaucracy? <laughs> you know, you take this kind of like overarching force of the Institute of Psychology, mm. you take that out of the room and it makes you so personable mm. and silly and relational and like wise. Mm. And so you just, the heart, my heart and many hearts open up to you and, and what you say, because again, there's a humility and that relational element Mm-hmm. I love that you decided to write a memoir and not like a trauma book because yeah. that's that's so much more powerful to me. We have a, all the trauma books we need. It's right. like we need more memoirs from trauma therapists, you know, that are learning these things. I think so. I mean, I did add a glossary in the back. I'm not going <laughs> to lie. I had to add my little clinical glossary. But because I just wanted people to, I wanted to be able to tie it together. So I go, oh, well, when I was talking about this thing, that was an example of trauma bonding, you know? I went, oh, there's that, that was fawning. So I I did want to give people that language, but I wanted, it's like what you're saying about my degrees or whatever. I wanted to get that out of the way and just connect with folks. Mm -hmm. And um, 
yeah, someone was talking to me recently about what I want to do this opportunity or that opportunity. And I love this thing that's sort of spontaneous. I couldn't believe it, but it came out of my mouth. I said, if it feels authentic and if it feels like it is a continuation of my healing and me just getting to be me, that excites me. If you want me to put on this expert hat where I'm going to come in as an authority, uh, every, every ounce of like cell in my body is just like get me out of here that that so does not interest me um that's the word authority that's the word i was feeling earlier yes well and honestly um there's something about that 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 is in part i think trauma response too is that um where i was shot down the most was when i sort of charged in as a child and said this is wrong and i organized an intervention with social services i was trying to be the authority right how and, how old were you um 16 can you tell us about that for people listening yeah so um a, a big sort of bullet point of my story is that my stepdad was grooming me to be his girlfriend. And only in the writing of my book did I go back and interview lots of folks. And I found out this pattern predated me. And I was just one more mm. example of the same story uh, in his life happening over and over. But when it happened to me, he took me to Vegas when my mom was out of town with her dying father. And he lied to everyone about it. He told me I couldn't tell anyone about it, paraded me around as a girlfriend. But he never called me a girlfriend in earshot and he didn't try to, right? So it's this very like, it's grooming. <laughs> it's very subtle and yet not so subtle at all. Mm-hmm. And um, I told a counselor uh, in my high school about it. And she said, Ingrid, this is reportable. Um, We're going to have to make a report, but I would like you to think about how you'd like to do it if you'd like to have a voice around it. And I was like, okay, I think I'd like to do that. And everyone was called in and um, I thought, okay, here's the point. I'm going to tell my mom. She's, I'm finally going to lay it all out. We just invited her in first. I said, can you come by yourself? Which, uh, you know, my mom the second sort of she was with my stepdad, it was like anything that used to be her melted away into his shadow. Uh, She became him. They were 100% merged. She wasn't my mom anymore. But I'm like, I'm going to get her back, right? This is the moment. And um, in fact, what happened is she said, well, uh, I believe that you believe those things happened, but I don't believe they did. So that's what happened when I tried to become the authority, right? It just, it mm-hmm. made things worse. Mm-hmm. And um, and how does that relate to now? Since, because your book, in a yeah. detailed way, describe, like, how did your mother respond to your, but did she read your book? Well, in, in all honesty, for four and a half of the five years that I was writing the book, um, I was 16 again, thinking, I'm going to prove this is going to do it. Not mm-hmm. only am I writing the story, but all these people that I'm interviewing, it was like I was compiling the evidence. And there were even times where I was like, this book is a love letter to my mom because I, you know, it's the classic, like, I will show you. <laughs> I will, I will show you that I'm worth it, that I'm not the liar that I, and, um, and I believed that it would work. I really did. And so part of the, third part of the book in in what is my deepest, deepest healing was also the biggest hurt that I had yet to feel, which is that she didn't believe me then. And she doesn't, she cannot fully believe me now. Mm -hmm. And it's why I called the book believing me because Mm -hmm. I had to stop farming out my worth, my belief, my story, my voice, um, to the people that hurt me. I just want to feel that. I feel so much for you in that moment. And it takes me to places where I really wanted, you know, to be validated or believed. Mm-hmm. And you said something powerful just now. It was so simple and powerful. You said she she did not then and she cannot believe me. And when I heard cannot, I heard capacity. Like I heard, like she doesn't have the mental, physical capacity to believe you because then she would have to feel the reality of her life. I mean, that's, that's right. so that's how you experience it as well. That's 
definitely how I experience it. And particularly because of how hard it was for me metabolize, to metabolize that. And there, and I have been actively trying to my entire life. She has been actively repressing it her entire life and stayed married to this man. And in his passing has an even like more lovely narrative, their relationship than ever, mm. ever existed. Right. He's, it's been very romanticized, which is her trauma response. That's right. So what she would have to dismantle, I just can't really imagine it. I got chills when you just said that because ooh, the amount of people I've worked with who are not suffering because of their actual traumatic events, but they're suffering because they're oriented toward people who can't confirm them. That's right. That's, right. So there's this like kind of cyclical, I mean, tr textbook trauma reenactment of that rupture happening every time they bring these tender parts to someone that doesn't have the capacity to see them. How, well, how'd you navigate? Like, where'd that go for you? My cat wants to be let in so desperately. <laughs> sorry, I'm going to go open the door. I have one too that does the same oh, thing. Oh, God. I'm so sorry. Let me let him. No, no, please. <laughs> and we don't even have to edit this out unless, oh unless God. you... <laughs> okay. Um, it brings me joy when life happens whenever it's supposed to. <laughs> <I> know. <laughs> you know, the, one of the uh, reels that I did on Instagram that ended up kind of going crazy was the one I did on this very thing. And I was so surprised by it. I, you know, it was the prompt was tell us something that, you know, you want everyone to know. And I said, the enabler can hurt you worse than the abuser. Mm. And it just went off like crazy because for me anyway, and this is what I shared in it. I always knew my stepdad was an ass, right? I didn't have the language of narcissistic personality. He was just a bully and a jerk and an alcoholic and all of these things. So I didn't um, endow him with the capacity in some ways that I did my mom. Mm -hmm. So, and, and she was my mom. So if your mom doesn't think that, you're worth taking care of or believing or, you know, even saving, like sort of begging her to, to mm -hmm. save pull me out. I would of say that. an intervention is that exactly. Yeah. Yes. Um, and I was in denial about that for so long. I mean, I do remember sitting on many therapist couches and I would tell the story about my stepdad and I'd be like, Oh, I'm going to tell you this story, this story, this story. And they'd go, but well, where was your mom? Like, tell me about your mom. And I'd be like, Oh, but you know, uh, I didn't have this language, but it was basically like, you know, she was fawning. She was so deeply in her own trauma response of deep, deep, deep codependency. And I knew it. Um, but in that, I gave her a pass. And I held on to hope, maybe one day, maybe one day. And so when you say, how did I navigate it? It was just like all roads were finally leading to a couple of things where I had to finally feel the hurt from my mom. Oh gosh, that happened right back there in that bathroom where I was lying on the floor, right? Mm. Just going, no, 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 no one should have to feel this. I cannot feel this. This is too big to feel. And I had to stop hoping this toxically positive hope that one day, you know, all of these people are going to finally love me, save me, see me, all that kind of stuff. And um, that's why I say for me, you know, doing this trauma work, and it's why I say my mom, she's in her early 70s, the likelihood is just not great. But for anybody like this, what we have to feel and process can be so brutal, you know? Is it worth it? A hundred percent. Am I grateful? Hands down. Uh, would I do it again? No question. Is it the hardest thing I've ever done? Yeah. Well, because you let your mother die. You That's know, right. You, you've literally allowed her to die on you. That's yeah. right. And the parts of me. And I literally said this to myself on my bathroom floor behind me. Um, well, I said I want to die. I feel like I want to die. Not suicidal, 
but feeling like I want to die. And, and it was after that process where I was like, you know what? I think those parts of me did have to die. And a part of me was dying on my bathroom floor. Those, that toxic hope, that belief system, mm. that idea that my mother's pain is more valid than mine. I can privilege her experience over my own. It kept me stuck <laughs> and it was an awful choice. What a horrible choice to feel like I had to make. Relationship with my mom, relationship with me, relationship with my mom, relationship with me. But I felt like it became a forced choice for me to continue to show up for myself. Mm -hmm. And and then the choice was made. I, I have to choose me. I have to choose me. And I'm a mom. And so when we look at generational trauma, I do not listen. I'm not a perfect mother. It is the hardest job on the face of the earth. But to the degree that I can, I want to break some of these chains that predated my mom and her mom and mothers before. You know, I'm I'm trying to be very conscious about um, what I do and do not hand down to the degree that I can. And it just felt like it wasn't a choice anymore. I had to choose me. So much there you know, that I'm feeling, I think what really, two things really move me and I relate to them. One, releasing hope. And two, I want to die and, and really identifying that I in the statement. Mm. I'm going to start there because I loved how you said not suicidal. Um, I'm sure as I have, you've worked with plenty of people who are suicidal. And what I find really interesting is when they, when they realize, oh, it's not me that wants to die. It's this habit that wants to die. They're no longer suicidal. They're like, oh, I can live and a part of me can die. Wow. So when you say that, it's just something I just wanted everyone to hear again, because when you feel that feeling mm -hmm. of death coming over you, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to mean death of your life. It, it's, a, it's allowed to mean these parts that don't nurture me, right? These parts that are outdated, these parts that are that are really trauma responding. That's right. So I, I loved when you said that. And the hope piece is huge for me because I, I it, it sounds so funny when someone hears us, me say this, you know, like releasing hope. I but, know. <laughs> you know, but hope is really, to me, it's just another word for bypassing reality most of the time. That's um, right. That's right. right. If, I, if I'm like pinned under a tree and hope keeps me alive through the night, awesome. I'll take it. Right. Yes. But when it's like a relational hope or, or like hope that something changes that can't, and I'm I'm attuning to my story of hope instead of attuning to my reality, That's it right. keeps me completely paused in that experience. One hundred percent. And honestly, this truth kind of blindsided me. Even in the writing, I was like, really? If the <laughs> Hope was holding me hostage. I couldn't yes. believe it. Um, and there was something else I was going to say about that. And then it flew out of my brain. Oh, maybe it'll come back. Darn it. Yeah, it will come back if it needs to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that part's important because... It's so important. When we were talking about the capacity piece, which I know people listening will probably want to hear 20 more times, meaning I look to people in my life who should have the capacity. Like we think mom and dad should have capacity for my pain or brother and sister or lover or best friend, whoever it is. And the reality is, um, no, they shouldn't. Like we want them to, want but them to. And they don't. This is the thing that I was thinking, it was projection. Mm. And I'm realizing this a lot, that I do this a lot, not just with my mom, but with a lot of people. I am someone who wrote their eighth grade research paper on alcoholism, the family disease. I am a seeker. I am willing to do whatever. I will jump in the trenches. So I project that same interest, capacity, desire, all of it onto everybody else. If they simply, if I show them the door, if I give them the book, if I did, you know, and dropping into reality that whoa this mm. is just this is just how i do it like this is <laughs> this really it 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 has done a couple of things it actually frees me even bigger than just when i get to let go of the hope because in my projection i've also and and projecting my capacity onto other people as I've endowed them with all of this kind of goodness, 
when they don't do it, it feels even worse because I imagine that they can. <laughs> That's right. That's right. But when I That's take right. back the projection and I just get to see them actually for who they are, what their behavior has shown me time and time and time and time again, it kind of lowers the bar on what I can expect from them. And suddenly it doesn't feel quite as bad when they are exactly who they've always been. Does that make sense? Oh, I'm so lit up. I mean, the reason I'm lit up and I was smiling and laughing is because <laughs> to me, like this is the key to freedom. And I remember having the same experience. I remember being the kid in eighth grade that wrote these papers. I not on alcoholism, but other, yeah, yeah. other things. And I, I remember realizing one day, I was in my twenties, and I thought, I've literally for twenty years, like since I was five, I can remember these thoughts. Yeah. For twenty years, I've just been seeking freedom yeah. and compassion and empathy and all these things. And I literally expect these other people in my life are seeking the same thing. Yes. And the moment, like you just said, the moment you release them from really the burden of your projection and you just yes. see who they are. Yes. This is where I say about relationship comes in. And and I don't, and people overcouple relationship as being with. I say relationship as literally my body and heart and, and spirit's response to you. To, mm -hmm. to what you're showing me is how I relate to you. If yes. I put my hand on a stove, I relate by doing that because it, it hurt, it burns. So I, yes. my hand jumped back. back. Yes. So if I see my mother as someone that has zero capacity for my emotions, I relate to her as such. I don't bring her my emotions. So everything starts to just radically shift, doesn't it? And then you start orienting toward people who do have capacity. That's right. That's right. It, it brings us more choice, right? Like conscious choice and why yes. we're doing it and how we're doing it. I think the tricky thing is, particularly when we're talking about childhood stuff, is like, you don't know any of that, right? You're just nope. like, and um, I was thinking about this this morning, Dr. Romani, um, who talks about narcissism and narcissistic abuse a lot. She used this phrase that I just thought, oh man, that's it. It's the fetishism of family. And the way that like media projects and all these ideas, like we all want that sort of home, our key, whatever. And then we kind of do whatever we can do to make it look like that and feel like that and elevated in that way. And so it's just, it's so complicated, right? I guess I just want to put it back in the like, sometimes I get these nuggets and I go, oh, like everything makes sense. And then I go, and you didn't know that for 40 years. <laughs> that's right, reason, that's right. You know? See, that's where the shame melts away for me, what you just said. Ah. It, it's like, if I didn't know it, what was I to do? What was I to do? Whether I'm 60 or 25, right, like right. what am I to do if I don't, if I don't know it at 60, I'm as tender as when I was six, right? That's right. That's so, right. You're, and this is the strange, I don't know what it is of the human experience is we, we aren't built to know. We're not born to know these things. We're born to be really open. And then that openness collides with something painful. Usually, um, if I don't know anyone who doesn't at some, some level, and then that something painful either becomes a story that gets projected and we, we stay in our trauma or we start playing with it, but we don't know we're allowed to even play with it until we know, right? It's a strange amnesia. Even I so want to know so bad that when you said we aren't born to know, it like went oh, like a little bit of a gut punch because I'm still, <laughs> even though all my freedom comes from the other end of this thing, yeah. I, just want, I still just want to understand it. Um, of course you do. And get ahead of it so bad. <laughs> of course. I, I, and I really respect you outing yourself. <laughs> oh my God. Because it's... <laughs> anyone listening knows this anyone empath anyone listening empathizes with you and I, and I i especially think of our fellow colleagues listening mm. people who hold whether they're coaches therapists whatever they are people that hold space for people yes. that the amount of um work we do in a session even to try to understand rather than the transformation that comes when we're just in relationship with when we're yeah. just co-regulating creating safety with so when you say that, it it again it frees me mm -hmm. to have that humility of oh, there's going to be a part, mm -hmm. probably the ego, whatever we want to call it, that mm -hmm. always wants to understand. And yes, yes, yes. That's okay. It's allowed to want to understand, and it never will, <laughs> like fully. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I love that. I can give rever like I go. Oh, I love that part of me. Like she is just yeah. this like soldier who just doesn't ever stop. I love that. 
And she doesn't have to be in the driver's seat, right? I can be like, mm. I see you over there. You know, mm. oh my gosh, you want to know. And I w- wish that you could. And I'm glad that you're here. You know what I mean? Oh, I like love it. This I love it. Relationship to these to these parts of me that they all make sense. They all make sense. And and they're all allowed to be here. That's the best yeah. part, right? Yeah. It's like I'm I'm never gonna override that part of me. I can't oh, that's imagine. So nice. anyway. It's just so nice to hear because when your child wakes up, I'm a father as well. When your mm-hmm. child wakes up in the middle of the night crying and screaming from a nightmare, mm-hmm. you don't go in and and either you don't either, you don't go in and get scared with them. You know, you don't run around the room and say, someone's definitely in the closet. We need to get out of here. You don't do that. <laughs> Even though Peter Levine did it with his first client and gave birth to you know tr- uh, some act therapy. But <laughs> <laughs> but you you don't do that. And you don't go in and try to like talk them out of it. You usually just hold them. You're just like you're scared. Here I am. And this whole thing starts to happen. And and when we do that with ourselves, it's so profound, isn't it? Do like you call you said, that reparenting you or do you, do you have different language for that? Yeah. I, I, I personally don't say reparenting, but that's what it is. That's yeah, what it yeah, is, yeah. isn't it? I don't know what I call it, but maybe I should call it reparenting. I guess that's probably what I would call it, but I love that idea anyway, that that that's what we get to do for ourselves that maybe didn't get done. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And that all of the parts get to be included in that, the terrified ones, the ones that still feel shame that go, don't tell them that I didn't really know. No, maybe I did, you know, Uh, the ones that still want to figure it out, the one who loves to laugh and be silly. I tell you, that's just to like bring it back to that beginning topic from, from a trauma survivor's perspective. My cat just wants to be in the (laughs) show. I'm a cat lover. That's probably why. (laughs) So for me to get to have all of these parts in one place on a screen, I'm not using this language lightly. It was terrifying. And I really believed and I kind of just had to say, well, if that's what happens, that's what happens. But I really genuinely believed that by me leaning into the hilarity and the sing-songy and the vulnerability and that I don't have it all figured out, I was like, I'm about to tank my career. <laughs> yeah. I really, really was like, who's going to want, like, ugh. and yet I, it was again, this calling where it was like, well, maybe then maybe you're not meant to be a private practice therapist. We'll, mm. we'll, we'll see what comes out of that because it felt so important to me. I think it's from traveling yesterday. I'm just so emotional with everything. I love the tenderness. But I go, (laughs) for me to get to be the silly part of me, the performer part of me, the 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 one who doesn't have it all figured out, the curious one, and the one that has some information and can kind of link this thing with this thing over here, that all of those are present in one space, was magic. I'm as you're saying it, this deep breath is just feeding me. It's like, yeah. it's so. <laughs> I it, it, I have a membership, and okay. someone in the membership was saying, oh, "How did they ask it?" They said something like, "I want to know how to be more playful in my work." This hmm. is like a trauma coach. I want to be more playful in my work. Hmm. And this inquiry came out of my mind in that moment. And it was, do I oppress myself in the name of your liberation? And when you just said what you said, yeah. that's that's it, where it took me to, which is like how I yes, control, yes, yes. right? Shut yes. parts of myself down so I yes. can be the therapist, so I can be the safe one, so I can be the yes. responsible. Yes. You relinquishing that, I have to say, it it makes me feel more safe around you, and it inspires me as a as a educator now at this point to to have fun to, yes. to celebrate yes. my aliveness with fun and our humanity, which and our is humanity I wrote about in the book because I, you know I think it's it's not just oppressing a part of ourselves in the service of someone else's you know sort of healing. We're actually uh reaffirming their shame when we put mm. on that that uh hat that says well i have it all figured out and i've completely healed and i don't know like pe- i can't tell you how many people i know they're projecting onto me some standard of something that i want to let you know we're the same we're the same there's no 
bar that I'm setting here that you now suddenly have to meet and you kind of feel like, well, I'm never going to do that because I'm this, that, and the other. I wish that all people in the helping space would drop that mask a bit, whatever their Mm. brand of that mask is, Mm -hmm. because it's the being, then we do get to be with. That's right. Oh, that's so good. I just think it's, um, there's this beautiful natural movement happening where a lot of clinicians are starting to be more vulnerable. Yeah. And you're a big part of that, of that movement. And you express that so beautifully. And I think what you just said was really powerful to me about affirming their shame. Yes. Um, even like reflecting it, you know, because when I think of myself, when I think of all the therapy, I went through my own period of yeah, grasping, yeah. grasping psychotherapist yeah, to, anything. <laughs> to tell me who I am, what I am, what's wrong with me, how fix me. And I remember the ones that really lit me up were the fun ones. Um, where I was really serious in my pain and just like stuck in my horrible, you know, story of childhood and feeling like the pain of just washing over me and the weight of my shoulders telling the story, you know, for the 20th, 20,000th time. Yes, yes, and, yes. and the ones that were just kind of like light with it in this way of not dismissing it, but they were like, right. their lightness reminded my body it's not happening right now. And I started getting to feel my aliveness and I, and it was reflecting a different part of me back to myself rather than just reflecting my pain or freeze or shame, you know, whatever that was back. Yes, yes, yes. So that's important what you just said. I think it's it's a, huh. it's beyond a resource. It's a part of the medicine of, of holding that kind it of space. It is. It really, really, really is. I think. Yeah. Uh, and there's so, you know, if we want evidence for that, there's a ton of evidence for that, right? If you look at like... Yeah, expressive arts and all of these things. It's like, that's right. that, is, that is the tool. That is the tool. So one thing I want to do before we close, I want to play one of your clips that is my favorite one. I think. Oh, I wonder what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Fix Your Partner one. Oh, um, it's, it's my favorite too. I'm it's ama- That's the one. That was the gateway drug to Ingrid for me, <laughs> that one right there. So I'm going to get it up right now. So people can... So if you're on YouTube watching this, you get to see it. If you're listening, you get to hear it. So let me turn this thing on. So we should not talk. Like many adults with childhood trauma, I often felt unlovable and broken. But then I tried Fix Your Partner. Fix Your Partner is a revolutionary way of becoming a parent to the person you're dating. So they might finally love you back. It's a proven long-term strategy for both abusive and unavailable partners. Every time I've used Fix Your Partner, I've been filled with hope and unrealistic expectations. Fix Your Partner won't actually fix your attachment wounds, but it will amplify them until they get so big you can't ignore them anymore. Fix Your Partner can cause severe depression, low self-esteem, inability to trust yourself and others, and unmetabolized rage. Do not seek the advice of a therapist before trying Fix Your Partner. Fix Your Partner has never been less affordable. Don't wait. Give yourself the gift of toxic shame today. It's just brilliant. And it, it's just brilliant. First of all, that music, I live for that background music. And you have the, I don't know if you ever heard of Laurie Anderson, but you have like, you have the perfect voiceover voice. And oh, that's funny. He has yeah. that too. Gotta look her up. It's amazing. But no, that I, that was the first thing I saw of you. And when I saw you were a psychologist, it made me love it even more. Yeah. Uh, and I just thought, this is great because <laughs> these things that we do, they're painful yeah. and they're silly. They're, they're both. And right. there's, the, there's this like joy of, of, okay, let's laugh at our silly trauma responses while we hold space for them. Like, let's be with both. So yeah. you really, in that one piece, you exemplified that being with both. And I was like, this person's a genius. Oh, you're so <laughs> Like well, immediately the reason hugged. I could do that is because I lived that. I lived that That's for right. so long, right? I'm not talking about like, I've seen several clients, several <laughs> codependent <laughs> clients, and they tend to think it's like, no, 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 this is me. And um, things like that real in particular, I didn't even have to think about it. This infomercial for Fix Your Partner came into my brain and I just like immediately recorded it. I mean... So they, these are just things that are living in me, 
that um, that I just I've come to trust. I've just mm. come to trust. Mm. And when I start to try to think too hard about like, oh, what would be funny? In fact, the the longer that I've done it, the less thought I give to what I'm putting out and how I'm putting it out there in a way. Um, because I think even that robs it of sort of that relatable, magical thing, you know? Agreed. Agreed. Um, it's so relatable. And anyone listening, you have to go to her page and just, it's this perfect curation of, <laughs> I mean, it's the balanced curation of, of humor and tenderness and, and clinical, you know, um, I don't even say education, but this certain, I, I wouldn't even, I know I'm going to throw that out. It's, it's this real lived experience of wisdom that just kind of flows from you. And some days it flows like a really funny, irreverent way, which I love. Mm -hmm. Other days it flows in this like really great, like studious, I'm going to teach you something, which I love. Mm -hmm. But either way, there's this openness to receive it because it's, it's light in either direction you go. There's a lightness to it. And, and it, it attunes to that reality of this person went through it took the wisdom from it and now they're giving me a head start with the wisdom. Hmm. Thank you so, so much. That's seriously. such a reflection. I'm so grateful. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm so thankful. And I, I guess my, my closing question is, is do you believe you now? Like, do you hmm. believe if, your experience? Tell me about that. Nobody's asked me that. That's really lovely. Um, I know without a doubt what happened to me. I know a hundred percent what it did to me and why it did it. I no longer think that I'm broken. I actually think that I have this brilliant body that did exactly what it was meant to do to survive the circumstances that it was in, um, that I coped with every fiber of my being in a way that was genius, even though it was also painful. Um, I have access to grieving in a way that lightens the shame that I've had this toxic, toxic shame that I've held my whole life. These secrets of, gosh, if you really knew me, I do not feel that way anymore. I logged on to get to speak with you today. Um, genuinely just excited because I go, oh my gosh, this is the person that I love on Instagram. I think you're so wise. You also bring things in your unique voice and unique way that allows me, even in this conversation, to hear and digest things differently. And I, mm -hmm. oh, I go, I'm changed for it. I'm changed for the better for it. And um, there was not a part of me that was like, <gasps> what's he going to see that I don't want him to see? And am I going to be found out? And am I going to sound stupid? These are things that I have lived with my whole life. And I genuinely today, I might feel them again tomorrow, but I do not feel them. Um, I 100% believe me. I believe in me. And I believe that what I have found is a universal um capacity for all of us to believe what happened, to believe in ourselves, to believe that we are worth fighting for, um, that we can take back our voices and our lives and our relationships and all of it. I believe it's possible. I, I didn't actually believe that before. I wanted it. I was seeking it. And I hit my head against the wall mm. eight million times. And I'm not, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm so grateful. What a ridiculous gift. Right. Right. It's like so many riches. I'm like, you asked me the question, I go, and then this happened, and then this, and this, and this, and this. Yeah, and yeah. It's true. It's true. I just feel, I feel so happy for you because, um, I don't know, you, you're you just such a lovely human being. And to know that you can, in your body right now, not feel like an imposter and not have shame, have a, a kindness and friendship with yourself. I'm so happy for you. Like I'm, you deserve that. It makes me so happy you have that. Thank um, you. Oh no, you're so welcome. I, I wonder, just for anyone listening, how how do people work with you? Where do they find you? Tell us about that piece. Then we're going to close. Yeah. So, um, so obviously on Instagram at Ingrid Clayton PhD. I've started a YouTube channel just so I can have a little more space to stretch out. It's hard to always shrink things down into my. Yeah. Um, and that's been, that's been fun too. So you can find me there. 
Um, and I think the new year is going to bring some interesting things, right? So the book just came out in September. I'm kind of like seeing the, feeling the effect of that, digesting that, taking a little pause. And um, I think there's going to be workshops and classes and things. So maybe sign up for my newsletter mailing list on my website, IngridClayton.com, so you can be up to date on all the things. I'm not taking... Um, private practice clients anymore. I'm not taking on, I, I just, it's, yeah, I'm full and keeping that sort of at a manageable place that I can, I want to work with more people. I feel like I definitely feel called to do that. We'll just see what it's going to look like in the new year. Yeah. Thank you for you. And thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me and your authenticity. Uh, I want to meet you in person sometime. And we are, we're going to go sit in the forest and be together. I can feel it. It's it's on my list and I know it's yeah. going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, my friend. Thank you. That's the end of today's episode. Now let's take a moment to notice where we feel the episode in our bodies. Close your eyes. Take a breath. And let whatever wants to come up, come up. And remember, those sensations hold the wisdom that we're looking for. If you want to go deeper, visit holisticlifenavigation.com.